Hello, everybody. I, the lights are so blinding. I just, it's just like a full crowd. It's, I can just see, like, I can't really see well, so I'm just imagining it's a packed house. Um, thank you all for, for coming, last session of the day. Uh, my name is Jed Sunwall. I actually run the open data program at AWS, uh, but I work very closely with the disaster response team, and uh, I'm really excited to be able to talk about uh, what, what this team is doing. It's, it's amazing work. I'm very proud of, of what the team has done. And uh, so I'm going to talk to you about what the AWS disaster response team uh, actually is, or disaster response program actually is, and why we have it. Uh, I'm going to share a little bit about what the team has done. Uh, but I also want to share with you just some insights into how we approach programs like this, how we think about disaster response, and how Amazon goes about building, building programs of this nature. One thing to, to emphasize is that the disaster response program is actually quite new. It just started in 2018, or was publicly announced in 2018. Uh, but in, in what I would consider typical Amazonian fashion, it, it's moved actually quite quickly and has done a lot uh, since it started. Since, since the program got going, there are a few use cases that we've identified where we can really help in disaster uh, response scenarios. Number one is restoring uh, and re rebuilding connectivity. Uh, you may or may not be surprised to hear that we have a lot of expertise in networking uh, and in, in providing IT resources in various parts of the world. And we've found that we were able to apply some of that expertise uh, in scenarios where connectivity has been lost due to a natural disaster. Uh, we work with a group called the, it's ITDRC, which is the, I shouldn't have said that because I, I don't remember, Information Technology Disaster Response Center, Resource Center uh, in the United States. So we, we've, we've partnered with them and collaborated with them to go into uh, disaster areas, you know, a after disaster uh, to restore connectivity. Uh, and then as you may have heard if you were in the keynote this morning, uh, we're, we're big fans of humanitarian open street map and have supported uh, the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team for years. And uh, one example of that support is, is today the, the map swipe uh, service that we're running. Um, I, I don't know if you guys have, have seen this, but on the way into the sort of reception area, uh, you have the option of, of actually lending your own expertise and your, your own expertise as humans who can read maps and can view satellite imagery to help uh, update OpenStreetMap uh, to have the, the latest information possible. And I'm going to talk about OpenStreetMap a fair amount uh, throughout this presentation because uh, through the work of, of my team, my program, the Open Data Program, uh, we're, we're big fans of OpenStreetMap and we support a lot of customers on AWS who rely on OpenStreetMap and who also contribute back to it. And then finally, another area that we've, we've found that we're able to, to provide a lot of support is in, in targeted support of of developers who are building applications for good. As we go out into the world and, and engage in, in disaster response scenarios, we find that there's in, ever increasing need to, to work with large volumes of data, to work with a wide variety of data. And of course, making this data useful and actionable in, in the field is quite difficult. You know, taking large, large amounts of, of varied data that are coming from disparate sources and making that available in an interface that people on the ground can understand with minimal training requires a lot of innovation and a lot of experimentation. And it, it's this app development that we're very eager to, to support and, and to enable. Because we know that it, it, it requires, uh, you know, for, for lack of a better way, it requires failing a lot. You need to try to build a lot of applications and learn if they're going to stick, if they're actually going to be useful in the field. And uh, we're happy to support that kind of work. Now, broadly, as we think about a disaster response program and where we can help and where we're needed, we think about three program areas in, in particular. Uh, I'm going to start with the, the middle first. Everything that we do, it all comes down to information. It all comes down to getting information into the hands of decision makers to make high quality decisions with limited information and very limited time to save humans' lives, or, and you know, well, to save all sorts of life, depending on the scenario. Uh, that, is, that is the primary focus here, is figuring out how can we gather data from disparate sources and then present that to people in, in an actionable way, you know, as, as information. The ways that we're able to do this 
uh, there's basically like the levers that we have to be able to do this are, are, are there are two main ones that we work on. One is our technology, the other one is the, dis the disaster response action team. So the disaster response action team is actually a team of Amazon employees who have volunteered to be deployed uh, in emergency scenarios. They're trained, they're trained in first aid, they're trained in CPR, uh, they're trained in the disaster response uh, information systems, uh, information management systems that governments use. And these are people who have very, very, very high skill sets uh, in, in IT and in various other domains, but that are, are willing to get themselves out there and, and to be deployed into emergency situations. So this is obviously a huge asset that we know that we have, is we have all these talented people who are eager to give back and, and, and willing to, to put themselves in these situations. And then the other lever that we have is our technologies. We collaborate across all of AWS, so all the, the people inventing new AWS technologies, as well as across Amazon, the, the various teams that are, that are developing new technologies across Amazon, and look at our roadmap through the lens of disaster response and through the, through the lens of, of people in need uh, in, in places that might not have access to the internet or, or great connectivity. It's, it's been really amazing to see how the, the disaster response team has identified certain AWS services and certain capabilities of Amazon uh, in, in order to, in, to apply those in an emergency situations that might not have been obvious to the people who actually originally invented those technologies. And so the way that we do this is, again, to identify how we can uniquely help. That's, that's job number one for this team. And I want to spend just an extra moment on those last two words, which is uniquely help. One trap that uh, many businesses can fall into is that you want to have a, a corporate social responsibility program. You want to be able to help and give back to the community. You have some sort of technology that, of course, you love. You have your biases about what you have to offer. Obviously, we have very strong opinions about the cloud. We think it's useful for just about anything. And that's true in a lot of cases. But it would not be responsible, and it would not be helpful if we showed up after a hurricane and said, hey, you guys should use S3 right now. They'd be like, you know what? <laughs> We're, we don't want to have to worry about whatever uh, products you have that don't make sense to us right now. We don't have time to learn something new. Uh, I'm sure the cloud is great, but if we, did, if we approach this, these situations uh, in this way, we would just be adding a lot of noise. And we would not be helping, it would actually be harming the situation. So, we, so this goes to the point of uniquely helping. What is it that we can offer that is unique, that we are uniquely uh, positioned to provide that will really help the mission? We, we take this extremely seriously. Uh, to do that, to identify those things, like I said, we inspect our innovations for reuse in, in disaster response scenarios. What is it that we have to offer that would actually be useful in a, in a disaster response? The truth is, and I, I, have, I admit to all my biases here, because I focus a lot on open data, S3 is a really remarkable tool in a disaster response scenario. But you have to know how to apply it in a way that would actually be helpful. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Once we've done that, we try to figure out how can we scale programs globally. Uh, we, have, we have deployed the disaster response team in, in actually four scenarios uh, that, that I'll describe in a little, little bit. Uh, but we, just because we've dis deployed our disaster response team and may have made, uh, you know, provided a solution that was helpful in one scenario, that doesn't always mean that it's going to apply in every scenario. You know, responding to a hurricane in the United States is much different than responding to you know, flooding, let's say, in Indonesia or wildfires in Australia. It's, it's all different. So we try to figure out what is it that we can offer that would actually be useful globally that, that, that could be deployed in any kind of scenario. And then we collaborate. We always collaborate with partners. We're certainly not going to show up uninvited in a disaster response uh, situation. Uh, this is, again, this is how we ensure that we can uniquely help, is that we always come in to a situation with the support of teams that are already on the ground, that already have trust with local communities, and who know actually what needs to be done. And then, like I said before, we use our own employees. We actually have volunteers at Amazon that do this. Uh, and it's, it's, again, I, it's awesome to see how many people volunteered immediately You know, when we said, hey, would you like to put yourself in harm's way to help other people? And tons of people are like, yes, I would. And then we're like, do you want to take a bunch of extra trainings uh, and agree to like, all, all sorts of things that, that you're going to have to agree to to be able to be part of this team? And they said, yes, we would. 
Uh, it's, it's, it's really inspiring. So like I said, we've deployed uh, the disaster response team in four scenarios uh, after hurricanes Michael and, and uh, Florence in the United States in 2018, uh, as well as after the California wildfires and Clark, shoot. I, I, was it, there was the fourth one. We had the wildfires, the hurricanes. Oh, and then Iowa and Nebraska, right now. We actually have teams deployed right now in Iowa and Nebraska and the United States uh, in, in response to flooding that's occurring there. And you can actually see uh, response teams here. Uh, so speaking of you know, how we can uniquely help, we have experience uh, deploying infrastructure that can, that can uh, have internet connectivity in remote areas. Uh, this is a team member. This is actually after I put, hit the wrong button. Um, this is a, a team member after the California wildfires installing a VSAT. So this is a, sat a satellite communication uplink uh, for, to restore connectivity in a situation when, when connectivity was lost. Uh, going back to my point before about the importance of information, this kind of thing is so critical because you need to have communication with the people on the ground in the, in the disaster area so you can find out, you can get real-time information about what's needed and where it's needed. And then this other photo is actually really remarkable. So this is our colleague uh, Amy Kwok, who's actually based in Singapore. And what she's doing here is she's taking calls uh, on behalf of the American Red Cross after the hurricanes. Um, I'm not exactly sure which hurricane. But Florence, Hurricane Florence, thank you, Holly. Uh, <laughs> so, what, so again, this is another technology that was created for commercial purposes. It's called Amazon Connect. It allows you to deploy a virtual call center. The, the commercial use case for this application is anybody who runs any kind of customer support or any kind of uh, telephone line, you know, hotlines that you would use to gather incoming leads or, or find sales opportunities and things like that. But what's remarkable about Amazon Connect is it allows you to deploy a call center and to receive calls and to route those calls using uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, very, very quickly. In response to Hurricane Florence, we were able to deploy, uh, to instantiate a, a, uh, an Amazon Connect call center within 24 hours. And then we needed people to staff it. Because uh, suddenly you have people calling in you know, who are, who've been affected by the hurricane directly and they need help, and they're calling the American Red Cross to get this help. We need to take those calls. We also get a ton of calls from people who want to help. They, they want to find out, hey, can I donate blood? Is there anything that I can do to help on the ground? And receiving calls and writing those calls efficiently uh, is extremely important. The fact that we can elastically scale up a, a call center and then scale it back down over time without provisioning any sort of hardware or requiring anybody at the Red Cross to, to deal with configuring servers and, and all of the logic required to do this is, is truly remarkable. And then you add that to the fact, you add to that the, the fact that we have uh, members of the disaster response team who are willing to volunteer their time to do this is awesome, especially because they're all over the world. So, you know, I don't, it looked, clearly it was nighttime in Singapore, uh, but they're able to take calls from the United States depend, no matter what time it was there, which is really great. Another area that we've found that we can uniquely help in, in an emergency situation is using what we call the Snow family of, of, of products. We have, uh, a few years ago, we launched a service called the AWS Snowball. And I, I love getting to talk about the Snowball because the cloud uh, doesn't ever photograph well. Like, we always talk about the cloud and there's nothing we can actually show people. Uh, but thanks to the, the Snowball, we can actually show a, a people a gray box which is very exciting to look at. But, uh, and I'm sure, what we need to, I need to talk to the summit organizers to make sure that we always have at least one snowball on hand at the summit so we can show them off on stage. Because if I had one here, I would, I would kick it over um, and it'd make an enormous sound because they're quite heavy. But these are extremely rugged things. These are designed to you know, fall off the back of trucks and withstand you know, a, a great deal of abuse uh, as they go throughout the world. But so the, the snowball, we, de we developed the snowball because we knew we had a lot of customers who had very large volumes of data that they wanted to get into the cloud quickly. And uh, due to physics, you know, there were some very hard limits on this stuff. There's only, it's only so fast that you can move data into the cloud or move data over a network. And in many cases, it's much more time efficient uh, to simply mail disks around, you know, ship them around. And so the snowball is a really cool device to do this. Uh, it's extremely secure. It, it encrypts the data end to end. So if you copy a bunch of sensitive data onto a snowball and put it in the mail, 
If it's intercepted at all, if people are able to get into the, the disk, they're not gonna be able to get anything useful off of it because it's encrypted. Another cool feature of the Snowball is, you, so what we're doing here, we're zooming in on the address label. So that address label is actually a Kindle display that is updated uh, by software, uh, by, by AWS. Because we use a Kindle display, we are able to control precisely where it's gonna go. So again, nobody can intercept it and replace the address on there. Uh, it is designed so that when, when we ship it out, it's going sp specifically to the address that you specified. Once you load up your data on it and it's ready to go back to AWS or wherever the, the data center that you wanna send it to, that address gets printed on the Kindle display and gets sent there and can be tracked, which is pretty cool. Uh, then we recently launched what's called the Snowball Edge, which is a snowball, just like, just like the, the original Snowball, somewhat more capacity, so it's 100 terabyte capacity instead of the, the 80 terabytes of the original model. Uh, but it also includes a server on it. It actually includes computing power as well. So you can run EC2 instances on the Snowball Edge. And they're also cl clusterable. So you can install these onto a rack. If you have three or more of them, you can, you can uh, configure them as a cluster. And then if you have a snowmobile, uh, you can move about 100 petabytes of data. So a snowmobile, it, it's a truck. <coughs> it's a truck full of hard drives. So again, very grateful to have these cool things that we can uh, show pictures of, like trucks and gray boxes uh, uh, <laughs> when, when talking about the cloud. Now, so you might be asking yourself, OK, so what does this have to do with disaster response? So the original purpose of the snowball is to get data out of a data center and into the cloud as quickly as possible. That is one application in a, in a disaster response scenario. In fact, we worked with a US government agency who they had a facility that was actually in the path of flowing lava. Uh, a, vol a volcano had erupted, this is in Hawaii. And uh, obviously there's a lot of government data, gov a bunch of research data and scientific data that was at risk because of this. We sent them a snowball. They were able to get the data out of the, out of, out of the facility and uh, securely backed up no matter what happened. And I actually don't know, did lava actually hit the facility? We don't know. It, it did. No. Okay, it did, actually. So, so yeah. So, so when you can't stop lava, you can at least get a snowball in uh, just in the nick of time to get valuable data out, which is, a, which is a great application of this sort of thing. But the Snowball Edge actually opens up a, a ton of really, really interesting possibilities. So just like I said before, it's a very rugged device, so it can, it can withstand a lot of abuse. Uh, you, can, you can fly these things around the world, you can drop them, you don't have to worry about it. But it has a lot of compute power on it as well. And what this means is that you can deploy a Snowball Edge out into the field and you can run uh, sophisticated software on top of it. Uh, in, in a disaster response scenario. And, and also, you can deploy whatever kind of software that you want on top of it. Anything that you can run on AWS, on EC2, and with S3, you can run on a Snowball Edge. And this includes anything that you, would, you, know, that you have licenses for that you can run on a Windows server or on a Linux server. The, the beauty of this is that this is, again, a place that we can uniquely help. So Amazon disaster response team volunteers uh, are can be trained to provision and deploy a Snowball Edge uh, to a disaster site, uh, which is really significant because this is the kind of thing that we want to make sure that people who are responding in a disaster scenario don't really have to worry about provisioning IT. That's something that we're actually really, really good at. We have the infrastructure to do it, we have the devices to do it, and we have the expertise to do it. So we can show up in a, in a situation and with a Snowball Edge, which has tons of data capacity, it can come pre-configured with predefined software stacks uh, to run workloads and to do analysis remotely without any kind of internet, internet connectivity. And we're also able to do this to run field simulation exercises. So like I said, the, the program, the disaster response program started in 2018. Uh, it, it's a young program. We've, we have not yet deployed a snowball edge in a disaster response situation, uh, but we have used it in field simulation exercises. And one that was really remarkable was we, we worked with the, the government of Peru, uh, humanitarian open street map, drone deploy, and well, there's a bunch of people. And, oh yeah, and Esri, obviously, yeah, and Esri, to deploy a snowball edge in Peru in an area with, with no connectivity to run the full Esri stack. Uh, and what they did is they were able to go out into the field, 
fly drones, gather imagery, uh, ortho-rectify that imagery, so it actually bring, bring the, the imagery back onto the, the snowball edge, run software so that you can lay that imagery over on a map, uh, and also that you could overlay the imagery with what's called portable open street map. You can call it POSM. So call it POSM because it kind of sounds cool. So POSM is, a, is a, an application of open street map. It's basically a way of interacting with open street map that you can basically take the entire open street map stack and, and use it remotely without connecting to any kind of external server. With this, they were also able to run ArcGIS, ArcGIS Pro. So, so they, they had a full software stack that they knew they wanted to use to gather imagery, to process imagery, to convert it, to map it, to analyze it, and then uh, edit, up, update OpenStreetMap data all on one snowball edge. So this is a, a re really cool application showing off what's possible with this amount of storage and this uh, amount of compute power in a, in a remote situation, a situation with, with no connectivity at all. Now, I, I want to talk a, a little bit more specifically about what the disaster response team does. An important thing to, to keep in mind is that we think of the disaster response team as a service, as a service that we can deploy uh, to, to help our government customers, our nonprofit customers, or NGOs uh, that are active in, in emergency situations. We deploy this team as a service, uh, as, as technical expertise, and what we're trying to do is augment and certainly not harm existing response efforts. And we're able to support program, we're able to provide this on the ground support for up to two weeks in, in every situation. I think there's also, it's also very important though to be very explicit and very transparent about why, why we do these things. Number one, and this is a kind of obvious one, uh, but I, I think it's worth saying, which is that Amazon's affected by disasters. You know, we're, we're affected by emergency scenarios. We have a, a footprint all over the world. We, have we manage a lot of infrastructure in many parts of the world. Uh, our employees' safety is extremely important to us. We want to make sure that, that they're well taken care of. And then, of course, a lot of, you know, when people are affected by, uh, by a disaster, these are, these are fellow human beings who we want to help. And this is a no-brainer. We, we feel it when, when disaster strikes, and it, it's something that we want to respond to. Uh, and there are obvious reasons why we'd want to do it. The, the, one of the other advantages, though, of, of having this sort of uh, program is that it, it allows us to focus on preparedness and on the importance of preparedness. Uh, like I said before, I, so I run our open data program, and one of the benefits of having large volumes of, of shared official data in the cloud is that when disaster strikes, you want to be prepared for it, and you don't want to necessarily be scrambling to get access to data that you should already probably have access to. Uh, one of the, the nice things about having data available for analysis in the cloud is that you don't have to do that. Uh, I can speak from experience. I've, I've helped with volunteer teams uh, that have mobilized after disasters. Uh, in the, my most recent memory of doing this was uh, after the Nepal earthquakes, I think 2014 or 2015, uh, where my friends and I are scrambling, trying to find a place that has good connectivity so that we can upload a bunch of satellite imagery, uh, or, or actually download a bunch of satellite imagery that we can copy onto a hard drive, get it onto a disk so that we can send it down to somebody who's out in the field to do this sort of stuff. Uh, increasingly, that kind of thing isn't, I, I haven't had those conversations in a long time, because increasingly, these data assets and imagery are already available in a cloud environment, and there are applications that people can use to interact with them. Uh, and of course now, that because of things like Snowball Edge, if you want to get these things out into the field, you can get them out there much more quickly. The other, another interesting point is that having this sort of program gives us a reason to invest in, in new technologies that can be deployed in, in, uh, and have broader applicability and can be deployed in areas with, with uh, low connectivity. This is something that's just of interest to Amazon broadly, and, and certainly to AWS, is that we want to make sure that people anywhere have access to computing power to do whatever they want. Uh, but I, I want to reiterate the point that we, we test new technologies in disaster response situations only in field testing and, and sort of like for training scenarios. Uh, one thing that we will never do, because like I said, we want to be helpful in these situations, is to test new technologies in an emergency situation. That is not the time to test a new technology. 
but, but testing new technologies for, for training purposes uh, and testing is, is actually uh, an investment that we're willing to make. And it's, 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 we've had a lot of success and learned interesting things working with partners doing this already, which is great. Uh, the other thing is that we, the disaster response team makes sense because it, it's another great application of, of my program, the open data program. So I want to point out here is that this slide of saying that, you know, the, the disaster response team partners with the open data program, I didn't actually make this slide, uh, the disaster response team did. But this was, when, when creating the disaster response team and, and coming up with a plan for how it would work and how it would operate, this was one obvious point of interaction was, was that it would interact with the open data team. We were already making a ton of very interesting Earth observation data and data that can be useful uh, for emergency response scenarios available in the cloud. And this, the disaster response team is a way to apply that data and actually put that data to work. And then finally, this is a philanthropic effort. So we, I can speak for myself and I can speak for the people that I work with on the disaster response team is that this kind of stuff matters to us uh, in, on an individual level and, and we're proud to be able to work on it. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm very confident that I can speak on behalf of the volunteers of the disaster response team as well that they're happy to have an opportunity to, to give back to their communities and give back to the world and this is a way that they're able to do it in a way that really matters. Now, when we respond to situations is highly variable. So the, again, we only want to respond, we only want to be able to deploy people when we feel like we have something unique that we can, that we can offer to help. And that's just, that's not always the case. Uh, so we work with our partners uh, that, that we collaborate with uh, to identify when is the appropriate time for us to deploy uh, based on the level of severity and, and what we're able to, to provide based on the customer's needs. One way that we're also able to, to ensure that we're doing this properly is that we onboard customers with the disaster response team in advance of, of any deployment. Meaning, we're not going to engage with somebody who's on the ground running uh, a disaster response scenario unless we already have an agreement with them and they have an understanding of what we're able to provide, what we're not able to provide, and, uh, and, and how to engage with us. Uh, along those same lines, before we deploy anybody, we do draft a statement of work. Of course, we have to do these things quite quickly uh, because time is of the essence in, in a response scenario. But we, we do draft a scope of work before deployment to ensure that uh, we're, we're helping and not harming in the mission. And then based on that scope of work and based on the, the customer needs, we'll determine you know, what are we sending? Are we going out there to restore connectivity? Are we going out there to uh, you know, rescue data from a volcano, for example? Uh, or are we, are we going out there to actually install uh, a snowball edge and, and help stand up a command center uh, that's, that's receiving data and processing it and sending it back, uh, back to headquarters? We have trained over 25 people already uh, in, in this program, so then there, there's, they've got various skills, uh, networking, software development, communications, uh, taking calls for the Red Cross, for example. Uh, and that's, we're just getting started. So the, the program has been largely focused in the United States, uh, but in this, in this year, 2019, we're, we're expanding to a year of the Middle East and Africa, uh, and Japan, I believe. And then in 2020, we'll be able to, to deploy this globally as we train more people. Uh, I mentioned this before, but volunteers are certified uh, in first aid and CPR, as well as working with national inc incident management systems. So you know, we, we, we know that we have to know how to use the tools uh, that our government customers use for this sort of thing. And, and we're working continually right now. I mean, this is a lot of the testing that we've been doing with Snowball Edge is to identify what are the predefined software stacks that we should have available uh, that we can make available via Snowball Edge. So we can set the stuff up in the cloud on EC2, we can test it, uh, and then we can create Amazon machine images and put that onto a Snowball Edge so that the software stack that we've, we've tested and proven working in the cloud, the, the identical stack can be deployed uh, out into, in, into the field uh, via Snowball Edge, and it can work without connectivity. And uh, that is our, th that's the way it works. Now, this is a, a fun slide to, uh, to spend some time on. So th this is the kind of thing that's possible now. 
And if you excuse me, I'm going to get some water. Maybe, maybe the sound of, sound of rain is making me thirsty. I don't know. Um, maybe I've just been talking too much. OK. So we can imagine a scenario here where we could set up a, this, this blue bar in the middle here is base camp. And we could set up some sort of field operation there, an infrastructure there, that, that can bring in data from the field and get it out back, back to headquarters. Now, the, the, ways, this, the ways this could work uh, are, I, I think this, is kind of, this kind of stuff is fun to think about. So, so first of all, I'll just bring your attention to the, the cloud part here. So in the AWS cloud, you can have a virtual private cloud for your relief organization that has all the software that you require for your operations, that you're used to using, that your staff is trained on. It can include data that you know that you need for a certain, for a certain kind of response. Um, that could be imagery, that could be you know, medical information, anything like that. You can deploy all that sort of stuff in your own VPC, your own virtual private cloud, in the cloud. And that's the kind of stuff that you can then basically take a snapshot of, load up onto a snowball edge, and have ready to go. So you, you can test your operations. Uh, you can sort of test the stack that you need, both in terms of software and data, and get that onto a snowball edge, which you can then deploy into the field. Now, if that's there in the field, let's say you've got a base camp, you're in a tent or something like that, you can be running this thing. Uh, an Amazon disaster response team member can, can turn up and install this for you. Uh, then you can start bringing in data from, you know, from any kind of source. It could be, su suppose you're working at a refugee camp, you could be taking surveys. Uh, suppose you're working in, a, in an area that's been affected by flooding. You can be flying drone imagery. Uh, really anything you, you need to do uh, to gather data from the site, you can start bringing it in. And we can, we can work to, like I said before, restore connectivity there, or perhaps set up networks that can be used to retrieve this data and then get it into the Snowball Edge, get it into the base camp. Then once it's there, uh, you know, like we showed the image before, of installing a satellite uplink, a VSAT, uh, we, can, we can get that data out into the cloud and into the hands of decision makers as quickly as possible. Uh, now that could be decision makers that are remote, uh, but at, at the same time, obviously, you're going to have decision makers that are there on site uh, at, at the base camp uh, that, that are going to be able to make decisions also based on the data that's being gathered and analyzed there. Then once, but once you're able to get it out, another thing that's important to emphasize is that, sure, you can send it back up in your cloud if you're using the cloud, but if you're not using the cloud, that's fine too. You know, we're not, this is not... <laughs> The point here is, is that you've got to you know, get data from disaster sites and get it up in the cloud because we want all this data in the cloud. If you have your own data centers, you can send the stuff to those data centers as well. Uh, the overarching point, and this goes back to the much earlier slide, is that what we're trying to do here is get information from the field that is critical to, to, to save lives into the hands of decision makers. Now, of some of the testing that we've done, uh, I, I want to emphasize uh, a solution that one of our collaborators came up with that was, would be possible or, and would be feasible in a, in a local response scenario, uh, which would include drone deploy. So I mentioned drone deploy before, uh, which is something that we piloted in Peru. So this allows you to fly drones, receive data, orthorectify it, uh, and, and actually you know, put it in a useful format that you can use for mapping. Uh, open aerial map is also an open source stack. Uh, that you can use to, to browse imagery locally. Uh, so you can use it to, to browse imagery uh, via an interface that's running on, on the Snowball Edge. Uh, you can then add on to that the layer of OpenStreetMap. And, and this is extremely useful if you're trying to make decisions about where to route uh, emerg emergency personnel who are, who are on their way. Uh, if you're in an area that's been affected by, let's say, an earthquake and a, and a landslide is closed off part of the road, you will want to know that. You'll certainly want to know that before you send people down that road. Uh, and so being able to work with, with OpenStreetMap data and then updating that data and getting it back to, to decision makers is critical. Uh, QGIS is also uh, a, a, a GIS service that's open source. So this is an entirely open source stack. There'd be no license fees uh, to, to run this stack, and you can run this all on, on a Snowball Edge. Uh, and then imagining this with a, a local access point and a mesh network you'd be able to have people out in the field working on mobile devices, gathering data from the field, uh, or 
receiving information from the Snowball Edge uh, based on you know, analysis that's being done and being able to receive that data on their mobile devices and make decisions out in the field uh, where people need it most. Okay, and so here we have a lot of links. I've seen a lot, I've seen people taking pictures, so you might wanna take a picture of this one. But I think the, the, the most important uh, point on here is that if, if you're if any interest in engaging with the team, uh, we have an email address on here, it's aws-drp at amazon.com. So you can reach out to the team there if you have any questions about what they're doing, if you feel like there's a, an opportunity to engage, engage with the team, uh, please feel free to do that. And then I also wanna call out, uh, Clark is here, in the front row. Uh, after this, you know, we, we, can, we can take questions um, after the session. But uh, in, the, in the meantime, you know, I'm actually ending this early. I hope you don't mind. I know it's the end of the day. But uh, with this extra time, I'm happy to take any questions you might have at this point. So thank you for, for coming. <laughs>